little village or good afternoon wherever you are logged in from the different parts of the world. We are continuing our series, Love Builds the Home. Last Sunday, if you missed the message on forgiveness, we do encourage you to go to our website or our YouTube channel. Uh, I've been doing a survey where I've been asking people, what is the most difficult part of 1 Corinthians chapter 13? And you would be surprised or maybe not surprised that for many people, up until today, the most difficult part of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is love keeps no record of wrongs. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of us can become very hysterical, right, in our arguments and conflicts with people, but we can also be quite historical, which is why the topic of forgiveness is so needed. Now, if you missed that, you can visit again our website or our YouTube channel to listen to that message on the litmus test of love. So today is very timely because we will be talking about the legacy of love. Actually, my mom and I just returned uh, from Manila last night. So I'm a little jet lagged, so you have to help me out, okay? Well, <laughs> you got to engage with me today, um, but I, I promise you I am fully present with you today. Um, the timing was just so beautiful in the sense that a few days ago, um, I was still, or rather last, last week pala po, I was in uh, Pinnacle Village, San Francisco. I was in the Bay Area. Around Thursday morning, I was on my way to the gym, and I received a phone call from my dad. And my parents, when we talk over the phone, were usually very jolly, even in the morning, regardless of what time it is. The energy in the Rodriguez household is off the roof many times. So when I picked up the phone, I was very excited on my way to the gym, and I said, hi, dad, how are you? Good morning. And I can sense that something was already wrong when my dad Pick up, or my dad was talking, and I could hear my mom was, was crying in the background. And uh, uh, we received news uh, last Thursday morning that my Tito Ferdi, so he is the eldest of my mom's siblings, so there's eight of them in the family, um, passed away. He had a stroke about seven years ago, and he has been um, wheelchair ridden, uh, bed ridden for quite some time, paralyzed from the waist down, has not been able to speak properly for the past seven years. And so he passed away, and I remember that was around 9 a.m. By 10, 11 a.m., we were already booking a flight, and around 12 p.m., we had a flight back to Manila that same day at 11 p.m. So I flew back from San Francisco to L.A., and then from L.A., but we flew to, to Manila. As a pastor, I've had my share of funeral services and celebration of life uh, events over the past few years but there's nothing, like, or there's nothing like handling a celebration of life of a family member. I've seen how God is able to orchestrate even the most painful of situations to draw people to himself and towards each other in ways that comfort and success cannot. I remember writing this down as I was preparing for my Tito for the celebration of life. Yung ginto ng buhay ng isang tao ay lumalabas pag dumadaan sa pagsubok. Basically, what that means is the gems and the goals of a person's life often comes out when that person goes through storms, when that person goes through trials. It's like what Job said, in, if I'm not mistaken, in Job chapter 23, where it says, The Lord knows the way I am taking. The Lord tests me, but after he has tested me, he, the, the, I will come forth as gold. Meaning the gems and the, goals of a and, and the gold of a person's life often comes when that person is going through something difficult. And so I remember Thursday po kami lumipad, the celebration of life, we arrived Saturday, and then the celebration of life happened on a Tuesday. This has been 20 years in the making, the opportunity to be able to share the good news to our family. Um, I was reminded in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, this is so true, that you learn much more at a funeral than at a feast. And so that, the purpose of the celebration of life was twofold. And the first one, of course, is for us to be able to honor the legacy of my Tito Ferdi and to be able to share the hope of salvation through Jesus. And so this past week has been a whirlwind, but at the same time, to be able to reflect on the mortality, mortality of life and to be able to be reminded of just how precious and yet how fragile this life is makes you really rethink and reflect and recalibrate your heart and your mind uh, in ways that comfortable moments and success cannot. And so the first question that I would like to bring to us is this, how will you be remembered? Because whether or not you want to be conscious about it or you want to admit, in this moment, in the here and now, you are writing your legacy. 
You are writing the kind of eulogy that your family members will talk and share about you at your celebration of life. And I know maybe for some of us, it sounds morbid, but the truth is when we think about death and when we think, think about the end of our lives, it makes us refocus on our priorities and what we are choosing to put first. So how will you be remembered after you have lived your 40 or your 60 or if God blesses you and gives you that opportunity to live for 80 years and when your time on earth has come to an end, what will people say about you? Now let's sharpen the question because the love builds or rather the love challenge has shown us that we can't fool our children, we can't fool our spouses, we can't fool our parents, and we can't fool our closest friends, the very people who know you best, you cannot deceive them. Maybe at work you, you put a certain image or a certain front towards the people around you, but when you're at home, people see you in your unguarded, unfiltered moments. They really know who you are. They know the truth because they've lived so long with you. They've seen you in all kinds of circumstances. When the pressures of life hit and the stress of life hits, who you really are comes out. Right? I always tell this to our young people. You can only fool the people around you for so long. But what is once in darkness eventually comes into light and who you really are comes out. And so I always tell our young people, ask God to help you with your character and leave your image and your, your reputation to him. How people perceive you are, that's on them. But what's important is God fix my character, who I really am. Because the truth is God will not use your image and your reputation to influence other people. He will use who you are, your character. And so we can't fool our children, our spouses, our parents, our closest friends. This is why the love challenge is so difficult to apply at home. So let's sharpen the question. What will the people who know you best remember about you? Now we fall into the trap of thinking that legacy is something that you're only supposed to think about when you're older. But we forget that our legacy is being written according to everything you are doing in the here and now. Every choice, every decision, every path that you are taking is writing your legacy. We will all leave something behind, but this idea of leaving something behind oftentimes sounds unintentional and passive. Which is why I want us to consider this variation. Don't just leave a legacy for your family live a legacy with them because when you think of legacy you think of pamana you think of inheritance you think of financial security which is not bad but oftentimes when our understanding of legacy is leaving something for your family we forget that in the here and now you are given that opportunity to live a legacy with your family and so i feel that this variation captures a more intentional way of us living a legacy. Can you look at the person beside you? Can you tell them, live a legacy, okay? That's our variation today. Not just leaving behind, but living a legacy with in the here and now. Now our scripture is in Joshua chapter 24. To give a very quick context, the Israelites have been fighting all their enemies in the promised land. And after years of fighting, the Lord finally gives Israel rest on every side, inheritance for every tribe, opportunities for the family to settle down. And so with that, Joshua seizes the reality of a new transition. So alam po natin yan, if you have a new transition in your family, that is an opportunity for you to set an ethos for your family. If you're going through a new transition in your career, this is an opportunity for you to set an ethos in your career. Where, where regardless of what kind of transition you go through, this is a chance for you to say, this is who we will be moving forward. Not just this is what I will do, but this is who I will be moving forward. Joshua 24, verse 1, the final words of Joshua before he passes away. And I'm sure, I can imagine all the people that were listening, perhaps they were at the edge of their seat. I wonder what my Tito Ferdi was thinking in those final hours. I wonder what he was able to communicate to my family members at his final hours. And we know that if you have experienced what it's like to be at the bedside of a loved one who is about to pass away and enter eternity, you know that you are at the edge of your seat because every word that comes out from that person's lips, you treasure. 
And I realized my Tito Ferdi was a very accomplished man, but none of his credentials came out during the eulogies. None. It was his hard work. It was his generosity. Right? I was telling our, our, my family members, I told them, in this moment, we get to decide what kind of rich we want to be. Do we want to be rich in the eyes of the world, rich in accordance to our successful accomplishments, or rich in love, rich in relationships, rich in mercy, rich in grace? We get to decide in the here and now what kind of rich we want to be. And so here, Joshua 24, you can sense he can feel the opportunity of this transition. Everyone has settled down, but you see the final words of a Joshua reflect the kind of heart of this leader, of this man, of this father. Verse 1, Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. Now, PV, transitional times are testing times. You know that. When you're about to be laid off, you're about to enter into a new job, you're about to have a child, you're about to get married. Transitional times, they are testing times. Moments of comfort are moments when we need to be checked. And perhaps Joshua understood Israel now was experiencing rest from every side, inheritance for every tribe, and he was about to pass away. And so he gathered the leaders of the people of Israel. Oftentimes our problem is when we have much, we turn to God less. One more. When we have much, we turn to God less. I remember Pastor Gina was reminding this of us, uh, reminding this with us, that when we live in plenty, sometimes it becomes more difficult for us to see our own spiritual poverty. And that plenty pulls us away from him, which is why it's so important what Joshua does next. It's a huge chunk of scripture, but I'm going to summarize it for our context Joshua then proceeds to recount the faithfulness of God from one generation to the next. Verse 2, Joshua says to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and of Noor, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river, and I led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac, and then to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau, and I gave Esau the hill country of Seir to possess. Verse 5, I sent Moses and Aaron. I plagued Egypt with what I did in the midst of them, and then afterwards I brought you out. You will see a pattern when you read this portion of Joshua 24. Verse 6, then I brought your fathers out of Egypt. Verse 8, I brought you to the land of the Amorites. Then I gave them into your hand, and you took possession of their land, and I destroyed them before you. Verse 11, and then you went over to the Jordan, came to Jericho, and then I gave them into your hand. So do you see the pattern? I sent you. I saved you. I brought you. I gave. Verse 13, I gave you a land on which you had not labored and cities that you had not built and you dwelt in them. You eat the fruit of vineyards and olive orchards that you did not plant. What was Joshua doing? He wasn't just recounting a bunch of historical facts to prove that he was smart and that he remembered what happened since the days of Abraham. Joshua wanted the people to never forget That when we won battle after battle, right, it probably would have been natural for the Israelites to think, wow, I'm great, or wow, I'm galing ko talaga, or I'm something special, right? I remember Timothy Keller said, if we are not careful, if we do not allow the blessings of our lives turn into praise for God, it will turn to pride. Can I repeat that? Because it's so important. That when you experience the open doors in your life, you are like the Israelites. Battle after battle, God has been so good and so faithful to you. If you do not allow that to bring you to praise to God, that it will eventually turn to pride. And so maybe it was natural for them to think, wow, ang galing namin. But that thought is always so deadly because Joshua knew that once the people took credit for their victories, they would soon turn away from the Lord altogether. Now, let's apply this to our own families because today is all about legacy of love. It's important for us to review past blessings, to remember the faithfulness of God, to ask our children questions like, Anak, do you remember when you were sick? 
nagkasakit ka, and we prayed to God and you got better. Or do you remember that time when dad lost his job and we were so afraid so we prayed and God opened the door? Or do you remember that time when we prayed for our friends to eventually know Jesus and then six months later they accepted Christ? Do you remember that joy that we experienced and that, and, and that thankfulness that we felt as a family to experience an answered prayer? Are we intentional in asking our families these crucial questions when we remember the Lord's faithfulness even amidst everything that we've been through that is so undeniable? God had proven himself to his people. And Joshua wanted to make sure that before he was about to leave that they would not forget. That's why if you look at the Old Testament, you would look at the books of the Old Testament, one of the words that you would always see is the word remember. Remember, remember, remember. Why? Because you and I, we are a forgetful people. Nakakalimutan po natin palagi. We always forget the faithfulness of God in the past few years. We forget just how deep of a pit the Lord has delivered us because in front of us is a giant. And songs like what we sang earlier when we are reminded that God, you are bigger than the giant is important. It gives us courage to face the present and courage to face the future because we know the faithfulness of God has been undeniable in the past. And so now, Joshua recounts the faithfulness of God and now gives the people of Israel a choice. Therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Maybe Joshua knew that while people had proclaimed to serve God, many of them were still secretly worshiping ancient idols of their ancestors. And so when we speak of idols, maybe you're thinking, but Pastor Amber, that was during their time. We don't bow down or prostrate ourselves like they did. Let's take a moment to define what an idol is. An idol is whatever takes the place of God in your life. An idol is whatever you feel like you cannot live without, that which has the power to control your emotions or drive your behavior, or they're the things in our lives that we give the most weight to. Now we forget, although the scriptures were not written to us, they are nonetheless written for us. It's the balance of the scripture that is both timely and timeless. Timely for the people at the time, and timeless for us, lots of truths that we can still learn from their journeys. The truth is, we have been fighting the same battles for all time. Because if in that time the people fell to the desires of their flesh and turned to false gods over and over again, the truth is the same thing is happening with us today. It's just that our idols have different names. Money, career, success, status, power, prestige, possessions, security, not necessarily bad things. But oftentimes our problem is we start to place more weight on it more than God to the point that you're willing to say no to God to get it. One author said, we may not prostrate our bodies before them, but we prostrate our hearts. And maybe you're saying, Pastor Amber, the truth is I am in full control. None of these things have a hold on me. But oftentimes when we think that way, that which we feel we have control over actually is already controlling us. And oftentimes the tighter your grip, the more hold it actually has over you. And so here are some questions that if you answer them honestly can reveal the things in your lives that you have substituted for God. And again, I am not exempting myself. Preparing for this message, I had to pause and reflect, what are the things, the secondary things, that I have substituted for you? As a family, what is one thing you most hope for in your future? Is that owning your own home? Is that seeing your kids to be successful? Is that a higher position in the company or a promotion that guarantees a higher salary? Where do you turn for comfort when things are not going well? What is it that without it, life seems hard to live? Or what is the one thing that you most worry about losing? J.D. Greer po, he once said that these things are not necessarily bad things, 
but they are usually good things that we make into God things. Good things that we make into God things that eventually become bad things. Because what makes you feel the most significant is what you put the most weight upon. Augustine said, if you look at worry, what you're afraid of, what you're sad about, oftentimes he calls this the smoke from the fires that arise from the altars of our idolatry. I was like, whew, I had to take a step back for a minute and think about where my worry and my fear and my sadness, what is the root of all of those things? So what is that for you? What have you given God-like weight in your life? Next question. What has your family given God-like weight in your journey together with your spouse, with your children, the people inside your household? What are the good things in your life that you have given God weight? Good things that have become God things that have eventually become bad things. Are you still with me, folks? These are hard questions, folks. That's why we're here on a Sunday to reflect and to pause, okay? Verse 15. If it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. So it was as if Joshua was appealing to the democratic sense of his audience by offering them a series of choices. Choose this day whom you will serve. The truth for PV, when it comes to our relationship with God and who we serve and we worship, we cannot be neutral about it. And so Joshua was spelling out this pattern that he was seeing in the generations of the Israelites because he says, choose this day whom you, ser- whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. One commentator was saying it was as if Joshua was spelling out this pattern, this generational cycle, or maybe the topic of generational dysfunction. When we talk of legacy, some of the things that we think about are experiences that are a result of generational dysfunction. Maybe you're sitting down and you're thinking about certain things that was passed down through your family that you can remember right now, whether that's addiction, abuse, or anger. When we think of legacy, there are some of us here that you cannot help but think about this area of your life where there were certain destructive patterns of thinking, thoughts, decisions, or behaviors that was passed down from one generation to the next. And so what happens is when we think of generational dysfunction, we point to factors outside of ourselves and we embrace a level of victimhood. And so we find ourselves trapped in this cycle of shame and blame. Question, when does our participation in unhealthy family habits stop being the result of a generational curse and start being the consequences of our own generational choices. When does that mindset shift from this is a curse to this is the choice that I will make now so that this destructive habit stops in my generation? For those of us who have suffered something from past generations, you might need to hear that this function is not your destiny. And maybe now that we're talking about the legacy of love, this is a time to acknowledge that before we build, we have to break. So what is it? What toxic or dangerous ethos in your family needs to be broken with your generation? Perhaps it begins by accepting that it starts with you. And that maybe, just maybe, our generation, starting with me in my own home, in my own household, What this means is accepting my responsibility and no longer just asserting my rights. And so you can see just how much weight is on this challenge that Joshua gives to push back amidst their double-mindedness and their half-heartedness to choose whom they will serve. But what's beautiful is Joshua would not do this through an eloquent explanation. He would do this through the power of an example. 
And I think alam po natin yan, with our kids, it can only go so far, a nice explanation, but there's something about an, an example, a principle practiced, or a principle lived out that just resonates you in ways that words do not. Which is why Joshua says, you get to choose whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. How many of you have a plaque of this verse in your house? Raise your hand. Let's go. Look around. Look around. I'm going to raise my hand because we have one in our house. <laughs> so, okay. Okay, one more time. Raise your hands just to see how many people in this room. <laughs> so, for those of us who are online, maybe a good, maybe 50% of the people here have raised their hands. Okay. Now you know where Joshua was coming from. Malalim po siya. He's coming from a very deep place. It is one of the most famous statements in the Old Testament because, again, as Joshua's final words, it expresses the heart of a great spiritual leader at the end of his life. To use not just an explanation, but as an example, shows us that Joshua's leadership was not just by polls, but by principle, not just by consensus, but by conviction. Joshua had already decided whom he and his family would serve. That's why you can sense this boldness and courage, and courage from within. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Again, as I mentioned, but when we, when we acknowledge the different idols or pursuits in our lives, whether that be power, prestige, promotions, or possessions, they're not necessarily bad things. But when we pursue them far enough, we come to realize that they are not able to carry the weight of our entire identity. Imagine looking at success and desiring that it carries the full weight of your soul, of putting your desire for unconditional love and unconditional grace and unconditional approval upon this very pursuit. And I think we've experienced those moments where we place the fullness of who we are on things that are not necessarily bad, but things that we know are not able to carry the full weight of our identity. The good and beautiful things of this world are but shadows of he who is the source of them all. Because at the end of the day, to be able to share that truth with our family that nothing else matters but Jesus and that only Jesus can support the full weight of our souls and that if we have Jesus, we have everything, to be able to lead our family to embrace that truth will be one of the most important things we can ever do. I'm reminded of that hymn, if you'd allow me to, to sing it for you, but. And the hymn goes this way. Turn your eyes, you know this one, Paul? Upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. To be able to lead our family to say, in the presence of God, and in the light of God's glory and grace, the things of this earth grow strangely dim. All of a sudden, the things that we thought were important are actually not as important. I looked at my Tito Ferdi. He was 65, mama. 65 years old. He's 65 years old. Still actually quite young, but. And I started to realize that the things that I thought were important were actually not that important. And that's why for us to be able to point our family members and our children, not just to the shadows of the things of this earth, but towards he who is the source of it all, is one of the most beautiful and most important things that we can do for our families. It isn't enough for us to merely have a relationship with Jesus and to just keep that to ourselves. We must do what Jesus ask, himself has asked us to do, we must go out and share the good news and what better place for us to begin than within the walls of our homes. So you can see Joshua decides, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then the people responds, 
The people's response, verse 24, the Lord our God we will serve and his voice we will obey. You know what often compels us to make a choice amidst our own indecisiveness is when we witness another person's courageous decisiveness. How many of you here you can say you're an indecisive person? Yes, I'll raise my hand. <laughs> you hesitate and you're indecisive, okay. I realize that many times this is what love looks like. Love moves beyond hesitation. Love sets the tone by taking a stand, and oftentimes love is decisive. And so in remembering God's faithfulness, who will we follow? In view of God's deliverance of our lives, what will we decide? Know that this decision is not just something that will affect you, because this decision to lead your family to love God and to love others can encourage other people to do the same. And that's why I'd like to believe that the people of Israel were able to also make this kind of decision because Joshua went first. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, verse 29, the end of this chapter. After these things, Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him in his own inheritance at Timnath Serah, which is in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gosh. Imagine 110 years. Now look at this, verse 31. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua and had known all the work that the Lord did for Israel. I'd like to believe that we would like to live a legacy that outlives us, yes? Which is why our legacy is not just your past decisions, but what those past decisions will eventually set in motion for future generations. And I know, Bo, like even listening to today's topic, it's really hard for us to think that far ahead to think about how your seemingly ordinary and mundane and daily trivial decisions can have implications for future generations. Which is why the thing with legacy is that it gets linked too often with leaving something behind in the material or financial sense. What legacy will you leave behind for your family? However, a life well lived doesn't just pass on val valuables, but more importantly, a life well lived passes on values. And maybe the more important question is this, what legacy will you live with your family? So next steps, PV. We solved and we saw <laughs> that about 50% of us here have this particular scripture in our house somewhere. We hang it on our walls and we declare that we have decided to follow Jesus and we're taking our family with us. I hope that after today's message, your goal of leaving behind a legacy, or rather, right, we made that shift of living a legacy is not just a solo project that you want to do yourself. Bring your family with you. Can you look at the person beside you? <laughs> and bring me with you. Tell them, bring me with you. Okay? You, you want to live a legacy? Don't do it by yourself. <laughs> bring someone with you. Okay? So I, I'd like to talk to the parents in the room. Okay? Perhaps in the earlier years of you raising up your children, you were prepared, planned, and proactive. But the truth is, Life got busier, your kids got older, and their energy increased as yours decreased. It's like, why is it? <laughs> why is it that it looks like they're getting way more energetic and I am getting more tired as the years go by? Why couldn't it be why couldn't it have been proportion uh, positively proportionate? where your energy increases, and so does mine, right? But as your, your, their energy increases, yours starts to decrease, and life becomes busy and heavy for certain reasons. And so the truth is, you still plan, you still prepare for things like your children's education and their extracurricular activity. But what begins to happen for many families is that faith starts to become an afterthought. Okay? 
one more ball. You come busy and busy and you're doing so much. And you start to think that a busy life is a fruitful life. That a busy life at least makes up for a good story. People won't think I'm boring because I'm busy. But think about that logic. I was telling my cousins, I was telling them, more than what's happening externally, right? Like, I'm really praying that moving forward and remembering the legacy of our Tito Ferdi, we would aspire for something to happen inside. Where you're not just busy, you're not just a busy bee doing so many things and you, being a busy person means you live a great life. But the truth is, when it comes to faith in your family, faith has become an afterthought. Spiritual growth doesn't happen on accident. Without intentionality, your family is likely to drift, and so will their faith. So three steps that we can take as we end today. Number one, go first. Okay, look at the person beside you. Tell them, you go first. Ikaw yung mauna. In apply sa ibang tao, no? We applied it to someone else. <laughs> no, us. We, us, us. Because that's what Joshua did. Okay? <laughs> I'm telling you to, to choose, but I've already decided who my family will serve. Now, parents, I, as a daughter, I want to tell you something, Paul, okay, as a daughter. I would like you to know that you actually have a much bigger influence on the lives of your children than you realize. Okay? Even if you think your kids are not listening to you, even if you think they're not watching you, I guarantee you your children are watching you. Beyond your explanation, it's your example. Even if it looks like <laughs> when you talk to us and our face is like, <laughs> you're laughing because you know what I mean. So they're, <laughs> maybe they're listening in San Francisco. There's this one 11 year old kid, first time, you know, you know who you are in San Francisco. It was his first time to attend winter camp. <laughs> and I was preaching, and my only goal was for this young boy to not fall asleep. That was my only goal. If the message comes out, great. But my goal is please do not fall asleep on me. So our strategy when we preach to young people changes. It's more conversational. It's more like a dialogue. I'll ask a question, and they'll answer back. The Altus knows during our winter camp. So my only goal was for this kid not to fall asleep. And we were talking with the kuyas, and I asked the, one of the kuyas, who was the kuya for, for this young boy, I said, did he ask you any questions? Any questions that could somehow reflect that there was something happening inside? <laughs> so of course, as, as an ate, I wanted to see. And then one of the kuyas said, actually, when we were doing our anchored style prayer, because we did it in our cabins, one of the questions he asked was, kuya, how do I have a deeper relationship with God? I was like, really? He asked that question, yeah, and he was serious. So I realized in that moment, even if you think you're talking to them and they're just like, <laughs> maybe it's also all my years in the youth ministry where you kind of like make assumptions by what you see outside, but you don't really know how the Lord is speaking to that young person. We're only humans, and the judgments that we make is limited to what we see externally. And that's why, parents, I would like to encourage you that you actually have a bigger influence in the lives of your children than you think. Two things happen. Number one, the problem is we underestimate the influence we have on our kids, thinking that, yes, it's true, social media, their friends, yes, all of that have some kind of influence and role in the molding and shaping of your children. But oftentimes, parents, recently, we have been underestimating the actual influence we have on our kids. And number two, we overestimate the time we have with them, meaning we think we actually have more time than we actually have. So, it will be difficult for us to talk about serving God or to talk about the way or to point the way with conviction unless we ourselves are going the way. If we do not prioritize our relationship with God, they also will not. 
If we do not prioritize that Sunday is a sacred Sabbath day, our children also will not. If we do not prioritize that even in the area of our finances, our kids also will not prioritize God in the area of our finances. I would always share the story that there were times where, let's say, there was an opportunity to journey with the church. I would watch my parents and see what they will decide. I was like 10 years old. When I remember that. They were having a conversation, but you know how, come on. You can somehow, like, sometimes hear the conversations <laughs> of your parents. And I didn't really understand everything in that moment. But when that challenge was presented, I was watching the decision of my parents. What I mean by going first is this. Make your own relationship with God a top priority. Yes, to teach our children about God, to share the good news to our children about God, but the most important thing is we ourselves make our relationship with God a top priority. Why? Because if we talk about God and it's coming from a place na pilit, instead of overflowing from a relationship that is genuinely found joy in Jesus, there's a limitation. There was research that was conducted that shows the primary influence in a child's faith is still his or her parents. They say the rule of thumb that parents might use is we get what we are. Dr. David Fraze, he's a director of student ministry, said, we can't out-teach what you teach at home. We're not that good. I was like, oh. Because what you teach at home, again, our roles as, as the pastors, as shepherds, and as ministers, as the church community to partner with you is so important. We're going to hear that message next Sunday of partnering with the village. But your role and your responsibility in what you teach at home, first and foremost, by your example, beyond your explanation. I hope that today you will remember and understand and take it to heart that you actually have more influence in the lives of your children than you realize. So number one, go first. Number two, serve together. If you notice, Joshua did not say, as for me, I will serve the Lord. He said, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. They conducted, so this is from Barna Group, a study where they asked young people, what is something that you would want to experience in the church youth group more? So I'm going to start from the first, uh, from, from the last ranking to the first, okay? Last was games. I was like, whoa, I'm shocked because we play already a lot of games. <laughs> so, okay, and the last one was games. Third, opportunities for service. Second, mission trips. But the first one was time for deep conversations. So according to the survey, we can see that the next generation wants to serve. But the important thing is, okay, so titas, titos, parents, ates and cuyas, this is applicable to us when we want to bit-bit our children, bit-bit. Uh, bring, bring, bring our children with us to opportunities of service. So oftentimes we think it's enough for them to have a point of service, but what's most, more important than having a point of service is the process. Meaning, before you talk to your kid, this is what's going to happen, a debriefing. While they're serving, you're talking to your kid, taking them through the process, and then after the service, and after the serving, you also debrief them. So it's not just a point of service, but a process of serving. There is something beautiful that comes when family members serve not just by themselves, but as a team, right? So sometimes what I think is super cool is when I see like a father and their child on the praise and worship team, like singing together. Or when we see a son and like, let's say his dad, that are ushering together. Or when we see... Um, parent-child dynamics serving together in the different ministries. Because a unique strength comes, which this wasn't the case, when I talk with my boys about how I hope they are willing to serve the Lord, they sometimes roll their eyes. Okay? But when we actually serve God together as a family, they never roll their eyes. Because it's not just something that they see their parents do, but it becomes a joyful experience that is shared. 
And so question, have you identified your children's God-given gifts to serve others? How can we serve the community together and not just separately? If you're a parent, I'd like to challenge this. I'd like to challenge you with this to bring your children alongside you in ministry. Bring them alongside you in prayer. Let them know when your heart is burdened for a friend that is looking for God. Let them know when your joy, let them know when you experience experience joy in answered prayers. May the Lord encourage us as we seek to serve him together as as one household. So number two, serve together. And lastly, Ooh, this one is also very important. I'm, it, 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 it rhymes, so hopefully you can remember. Okay, <laughs> Yeah, it kind of rhymes. Resolve to stay involved. Resolve to stay involved. When life happens, kids happen, busy schedules happen, we start to wonder, is it even possible to continue to serve with our families? There are some of us here that you're in that season of having little ones and maybe staying at home is so much easier than putting all the effort required to go to church. So I was talking to one couple in San Francisco and the parents were recounting, this is the crazy routine that happens that even before we get to PV, oh my gosh, all my energy has already been spent. Or maybe it's not the kids. It's your own busy schedule and you don't have the time or energy to make it to church. And so you promise yourself that you'll catch it online. People might even question the practicality that your life is already busy enough that financially it doesn't make sense. And if I step back, I'm sure God will understand, right? But there's something special about being in the house of God. And maybe serving will look different during the different seasons of your life. And that's why choosing to resolve to stay involved, right? I've been mentioning to to a lot of our people the past few weeks that love is creative. And there is something about resolving to stay involved even in the different seasons of your family's life. I still remember going to church even though mama had a lot of deadlines. Midweek was a top priority for us even if it was in the middle of the week and had tests. Church was a top priority growing up. And I didn't realize that the seeds that were planted in our hearts with regards to how important it was to be part of a church community, I will not truly see the fruits or my full realizations until I got older. Because what my parents chose to prioritize, I eventually chose to prioritize. Does that make sense, Paul? That's why even in the different seasons of your life, resolve to stay involved. Because involving your children might even make you more effective as you serve together. So, go first, serve together, and resolve to stay involved. A few steps to remember that maybe it's not about us living, uh, leaving behind a legacy for our, fa- for our families, but choosing to live a legacy with them. Don't just make it a personal or solo goal to make love your greatest aim in this life. Dream to live that kind of legacy with your family. Take your family with you, Paul. Take your parents with you. If you're a son or daughter and your burden is your desire to just serve with your family members, your burden is for your parents to know the love of God, then take your family with you in that journey. When you think of legacy, don't just think of what people will say about you when you die. It's, I want to be known as someone who took my family on a journey, who said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's not just a decision that I make personally, it's a decision that we made together. And leading your family towards that direction will not be easy. Because the gods of the Amorites and the idols that our ancestors worshipped before... Again, the idols that we worship now, they just have different names. Will tempt us and pull us away from the source of all these good, of all all these blessings and the goodness that we experience now. So when it comes to living a legacy, take your family with you. 
Now, I mentioned earlier that the idols that we worship often take the form of good things that we make a God thing that eventually become bad things for us in the long run. In fact, it can become so bad that we make God an accomplice in the pursuit of our idols. Oof. It's what our pastors remind us. It's it's no longer, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's, as for me and God, we will serve our family, right? Pastor Gina reminds that to us many times. And instead of offering our lives to be used by God, we use God for our own selfish ambitions. Today, we will sing a song that I grew up listening to and, 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 and singing together with the community. And the song is a reminder for us to offer our lives to God. It's an older song, but a beautiful song. And I pray that this song would encourage us to lead our families towards living a legacy of love for future generations. Let's stand up as we end.
Let's close our eyes and bow down our heads. At this time, do what Joshua did for the people of Israel. Can you reflect and recount the undeniable faithfulness of God in your life? In those moments where you knew that it was not because of anything you did, but because of God's grace, which is more than enough through every season of our lives. He protected you. He redeemed you. He called you, invited you, gave you comfort and strength and refuge. And not only God's faithfulness for your life, but his faithfulness upon your family. All the many chances, all the sorries that were said, forgiveness that was extended, tensions and arguments that were resolved, healing that happened in your family, and even the ongoing process to get closer to each other. Before we ask God of anything, can you think about it? Be very intentional. And allow the faithfulness of God to be reflected back to praise for him. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you. Even when our lives haven't always been good, you have been so good to us. Who you are has never changed. Your love has been constant. You have been the God who has redeemed and saved and saw us through even in the midst of our storms in the midst of conflict in the midst of comfort in the midst of success in the midst of open doors we give back to you all the glory all the praise all the honor Now in this moment, ask God to help you redefine legacy. Beyond financial security, beyond your inheritance, your physical inheritance to your children, reflect on the kind of life you're living now because it's not valuables, it's values. It's not a life of material wealth. It's a life that is rich in love, rich in mercy, rich in forgiveness, rich in grace, and a life that reflects the goodness of our Creator. If you're a parent, pray for yourself. If you're a son or daughter, pray for yourself. If you're a lolo, a lola, tito, tita, ask that God would begin your legacy of living your legacy. Ask Him to start within the walls of your own home. And ask him for the courage to choose, not just today, but for the rest of our lives, to choose to worship and to serve the living God. Father, as we come to you, we first and foremost want to ask for forgiveness in the times that we chased what is secondary, where we put God weight into the things of life that were good, but these pursuits that could not carry or support the full weight of our souls, of our desire to be loved unconditionally. Father, only you can satisfy that need. And we pray that you would give us the courage and the wisdom to lead our families to you. We thank you so much again for today. 
And we pray, oh God, that this week you would give us very practical ways to say not just with our lips, but with our lives. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We thank you for Pinnacle Village. We thank you for the series Love Builds the Home. We thank you continually for the provisions that you give through the work as we cheerfully entrust to you, O oh God, the resources, knowing, O oh God, that you have been the provider of all things. Maraming salamat po, and to you we give all glory and praise. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you.